Well, welcome once again here in my office in Dallas, Texas. Thank you for joining us as we continue to just study the Bible. One of the things I'm so grateful for in the midst of this pandemic is that our church continues to take discipleship seriously in some very uh, specific and particular ways. And one of those ways is that we still believe in the importance of studying God's Word together. Last week, we started a new series called The Names of God, and we started an introduction with why it's important to study the names of God. And this week, we begin with the very first name that Israel gave to their God. So I, I want to begin with a reflection on the first year I was married, 1998. Lots of unexpected things happened. The Tennessee Volunteers actually won the national championship in 1998. But something else happened in 1998. There was the expectation for a new volume, a new story of the most popular movie franchise, perhaps in the history of our country, Star Wars. 1999, there was a episode one that came out, which might not sound all that much of a big deal to you, but for me, uh, Star Wars was very much a part of my childhood. In fact, Star Wars came out, the original Star Wars came out uh, on the year of my birth in 1977. I loved these movies. So when a new Star Wars movie came out, I can remember feeling a little puzzled, a little lost, because it was simply titled Episode One. You see, I had no idea that the original Star Wars that I had watched as a kid a New Hope, Empire Strikes Back, The Return of the Jedi, was actually a movie that entered into the middle of a story. I had no idea how the Star Wars story actually began. Now, there were books written about it, but movies hadn't been made about episode one yet. I had entered in at episode four. I tell you that story because it's important to think about the Bible as a story. The Bible has an author who is God. The Bible has a beginning, a middle, and even an end. But so many times we assume that the Bible starts with Jesus, or maybe the Bible even starts with the story of the church, and all that happened before that really doesn't matter as much because really the main point of the story of the Bible is Jesus. Now, don't misunderstand or mishear me. I think Jesus is very, very important. I think the letters of Paul and the story of the church is deeply important, but we can't begin with episode four. We have to go back to episode one which is why the name of God, Elohim, is so important. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. You don't even have to turn in your Bible. You know it by heart. In the beginning, episode 1, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, now that word for God is not the word Jehovah or Yahweh, it's a very special, specific name. It is the name Elohim. It's the name that the Hebrews gave to their God, and it's a story of how they understood their world to be created. Now, now the name Elohim, E-L, actually means God, but Ohim means many or plural. So does that mean that God is, is uh, a number of gods at the same time? Well, part of my response to that is yes. We worship as Christians a God who is many, but yet is still one. Is Genesis 1 a reference to God being the Trinity? Perhaps, but I don't think Israel and the Hebrews had any kind of way to understand God in a pluralistic uh, viewpoint. But the point is this, plural or plurality could also mean strength or might. So what Israel was declaring at the very first of their story was that in the beginning, this strong, mighty, powerful God, Elohim, created everything. God as creator. I bet you can go back and remember stories from your youth about how 
the world was created. Or maybe you grew up in church singing one of my favorite songs, This Is My Father's World. You know, God as creator is not just something that that babies need to learn about. God as creator is not just something that we use as an argument to disprove some scientific theory or even to prove some scientific theory. God as creator is throughout the entire story of Scripture. So I want to give you three reasons why I think it matters that we understand God as Elohim, God as mighty God, God as creator. Now, first and probably most obvious, Elohim matters because it tells us that we as worshipers and followers of this mighty creative God have purpose. Genesis chapter 1 verse 27 says that after God had created all of the animals, all of the plants, all of the trees, God then created humankind, human beings, in his own image. And he even says it again, in his own image, God created them. You and I were the first ones to be called not just good, but very good. (laughs) Scholar N.T. Wright describes the creation story in this way. He says that it's almost like the grand curtain call of creation. Now, I don't know if you go to Broadway shows, but on a curtain call at the very end of a, of a show, who comes out first? The ones who come out first are the minor characters, but who comes out last and often gets the most applause? The major character, the one who is the centerpiece of the entire show. Now, of course, God is the centerpiece of the show, but if we looked at the story of creation as a grand curtain call, you and I, created by the mighty creator God, are the last characters to appear on the stage. And I imagine God stands up and gives a rousing round of applause, a standing ovation, because that's what sets us apart. That's what gives us purpose. We have been created in the image of God. Listen to Isaiah 43. This this theme goes throughout the pages of Scripture. Because you are precious in my sight and honored and I love you, I give people in return for you, nations in exchange for your life. Do not fear, for I am with you. Bring forth the people who have eyes, even some who are deaf, deaf yet have ears. Let all the nations gather together and let the peoples assemble, because I am the Lord. You see, God is always reminding his people of his creative wonder and his creative intent. And of course, Psalm 139 in verse 13, you know this verse, for you are fearfully and wonderfully made. God God is always about reminding us that we have been created in his image, and this should sustain us in times where we feel attacked by these other voices that tell us, you know, you're not good enough. You You don't measure up. Before I became a preacher, I was able to minister to students, and I was a youth minister or a youth pastor. One of the things I did on retreats is I would have students look at a mirror and use a uh, a marker to write all the things that they didn't like when they saw themselves in the mirror. It was a long exercise to help them understand that when they look in the mirror, there are some things that we see, but that ought to be replaced by what God sees. So after we would usually use that mirror as a as a moment of confession and God I confess all of these things that I don't like I would have an adult or a sponsor come through with some music playing and erase all of those things that we see and return it to what God sees to what God has created in us I'm reminded of what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 for you are God's work of art it's a direct reference to God as creator you see that's uh, one reason why the name Elohim ought to matter to us it's a reminder that we have deep and intentional purpose 
from a God who longs to create you and I, and we are very good. Secondly, Elohim ought to remind us that God is sovereign. Sovereign meaning God is over all. God is in control even when things begin to spin out of control. And we know how this feels even now in this season, even in this election cycle. I was talking with some a family member this morning who will go unnamed. And, and they began to just communicate how disheartened they were and how they, they didn't know who to trust. And they had lost uh, some sense of believability in the election and in our country. And I understand that. I get that. I can appreciate that. But isn't it good to know that God is still sovereign? Despite what happens in our country, despite what's going on in our world, we can be reminded that God is sovereign. Well, that's easy when it's the country, but what if it's about you and things going on in your life? I'm reminded of the hard, hard story of Job and, and how Job had his property and his children taken away. But one of the parts that you may have forgotten about the story of Job is it wasn't just his property or his children. If that wasn't bad enough, uh, Job was inflicted with sores all over his body. I mean, if there's anyone that can claim, well, when it rains, it actually pours. It's actually Job. Uh, listen to what Job says. Why is light given to anyone in misery and life to anyone bitter in their soul? The one who longs for death, but it does not come and digs for it more than hidden treasures. Why is light given to one who cannot see the way, whom God has fenced in? Truly the thing that I fear comes upon me, and what I dread befalls me. I am not at ease, nor am I quiet. I have no rest, but trouble comes. Whew. Job is in a really low place, but if you go to the end of the book in Job chapter 38... 37 chapters, Job uh, finds himself in this place of desolation, in this really low place, he even goes to friends who are of no help. But listen to how God responds. Job 38, verse 4, Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined the earth's measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the heavenly beings shouted for joy? Who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out from the womb? Or when I made the clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band? What is God appealing to when Job is at its lowest space? God's creative work. Elohim reminds Job, it's the creation that ought to assure you of my sovereignty. That's not an excuse for being sad. and It's not a way to, to wish away bad things or to think that God is somehow coming to Job and saying, Job, you just need to get over it and get tough. No, God is reminding Job that because he created all that was around him, Job could be assured that God was sovereign. Here at the Highland Oaks Church, we suffered a devastating loss a few weeks ago. We didn't just lose a shepherd. So many of us lost a friend, one of our elders named Dan Page. And it's been really difficult to talk with his widow, Judy. But, but Judy is always quick to hold in tension how hard and how painful the journey is with how grateful she is that God is still sovereign. Judy knows this deep within her bones. And it, it doesn't necessarily mean that she can be happy and go along skipping in the shadow of her husband's death. No, it's a tension that she lives with, that even though death hurts, death stings, she can know that the Elohim, the Creator God, is sovereign. And that is good news. And finally, it's good to know God as Elohim because God continues to create again and again. Creation was not just a one-time event for the story of Israel's God. God moves in and creates. Have you ever thought about the fact that the plagues that delivered 
uh, Israel from Egypt, those plagues were rooted in the story of creation that God used again, God's creative acts to move Pharaoh's heart to deliver the people. And you know how the story goes. Israel leaves Egypt and is almost escaped from uh, the pursuit of Pharaoh's army. And then what does God do? God doesn't just strike down the Egyptians. God parts the sea. Now, now you may think that that was just uh, a way for Israel to cross over into land and to get away. But what if that story is also a reminder to all of the Israelites who had been enslaved? God is sovereign and God will continue to create a way again and again and again. This is also something we miss in the story of David and in Psalm 51, when, when David is crying out in his brokenness. Do you remember what David says? David says, create in me a clean heart, O God. That word create is the Hebrew word bara. Would you like to know that that's the word that was used in Genesis chapter 1? <laughs> that when David is at his lowest point, consumed by his sin, consumed by his iniquity, Psalm says. He pleads his case to Elohim, the one who can create again and again. Creation comes in the midst of our need for God to make something out of nothing. This is why Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he says, if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. Everything has become new. Do you hear what Paul says? Everything, not just some things. Everything. God can create in you something beautiful, something new. In the midst of all of the ashes, in the midst of your shame, in the midst of whatever you feel God could never take away, Elohim, the creator God, says, I am big enough, I am strong enough, I am mighty enough to do this again and again and again. Israel's God was called Elohim not just to assure them that God was at the beginning, but it was to remind them that God was at the beginning, at the middle, and God will certainly be at the end. God is is everlasting, sovereign, and mighty. God is Elohim. Thank you for joining us. I hope you've learned something. Do me a favor. If you think this has been helpful, share this with somebody else and encourage them as well. But I look forward to seeing you back next week as we unpack and explore another name of our mighty and sovereign God.